Hey, it's Koro and we're back with 80 Days and if you have seen the last part we were in Delhi, India so let's see where we're going to go next. Can't remember what our plan was. So we could go to Agra on a palanquin, palanquin? <laughs> or we could go all the way down here to Madras which could be more interesting but Agra looks like it might cut us across this way which I think is quite smart. So let's go. It's going to be hot and uncomfortable. So if you remember, we have to converse as we travel, ask questions, uh, try and figure out where the next route will be once we reach our destination. You can also look after Fog by attending to him, but I'm going to converse first because I need to know where we're going after. Uh, do you want to know about Agra? Walking city is tended by thousands of artificers. Uh, how will we cross the Pacific this year? There are many options, but which one we will choose will decide our route across the Americas. Chittagong. Have you discovered anything in the times concerning Chittagong? Chittagong. <laughs> For instance, the quickest way to Chittagong from here is through Calcutta. Very good. So this should open up a route for us on the map. I was weary of being on the road so long, despite the remarkable cities and sights we had seen since departing Kabul. Yet when Agra came into view and tossed aside any mem remembrance of my journey upon the ancient Grand Trunk Road, at first I only saw... The white marble magnificence of the Taj Mahal, its towers nearly touching the clouds. Oh, I had heard rumours, of course, but the truth of the vast walking city perched high atop its pillar-like mechanical legs, this is very fantastical, but left me with only one question. What would it feel like when it walked? I suppressed a shiver as I regarded our marvellous destination. So, the marble. The medallion could earn us well here, that's right. So if we go to the market, we might be able to sell... That medallion, this one here, 2,300. Our funds are extremely strong. I don't normally have anywhere near this much money. Uh, we could buy a cold compress, left of the law, the shaving kit, monkey wrench for engineer. False passport. I don't think we're going to do left of the law. Might do cold compress in case I need to look after my master. We don't need the European train timetable anymore. Uh, we could probably move some things over so that we don't have... We could fit some more stuff in later. Okay, let's figure out where we're going to go next. Staying overnight. Before retiring, I attended to Monsieur Fogg, because look, he's, yeah. Providing him with clipped mustaches. I'm in fine form, but we must make haste. Right, let's explore. So we can go... Wow, all the way to Calcutta? The perambulatory city of Agra was itself a wonder. The Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan had wished to build a monument to his great love Mumtaz, and instead of a mere building, had commissioned a roving city. The vast white granite magnificence of the Taj Mahal perched on the plateau atop its jointed fortified legs. A fitting monument to great love, one that my Frenchman's heart could not disapprove of. Her sovereignty was a contested matter. The British had laid claim to her, but she passed through independent territories on her, her peregrinations. What a word. Her power source was an enduring mystery. How can one claim to own a city which moves from place to place? It is ridiculous a notion as planting a flag upon the moon. Well, <laughs> I was just glad she worked. Her safety record was unimpeachable if one did not count the occasional sleeping farmer crushed beneath her granite clad foot. We boarded Agra at noon. She would be walking to Calcutta when the sun set, taking us with her on her unvarying circuit. Let's go. High temperatures. This will lose us 20 health, but that's okay. We should get that back. One of the scarlet cloaked city officials rang a brass bell, answering tolls echoed from all corners of the city of Agra. While the sound still echoed in my ears, the city lurched underneath me, tilting first to the left and abruptly to the right. We were off. The walking city had begun, begun its circuit. She settled down into a regular rhythm after a few tottering steps, and by evening I barely noticed the slight tilt and yaw developing a kind of sea legs. Alright, well. We shall converse, I think. Greetings, Madame La Navigateur. I am one of the city's seven great navigators. Okay, Calcutta. What do you know about Calcutta? They say Calcutta is full of revolutionaries and independence fighters. We go from there to Chittagong. I believe so. Chittagong is connected to by boat. Then can we go Chittagong to Manila? 
let's just say some buyers will pay well from Amethyst from Manila, I guess. This is this is quite the route to Singapore. Oh, that would be good. I'm going to Singapore myself in nine weeks' time. I'm actually I've already been there by the time you see this video. Ooh, recording from the past. Truth be told, the sound was more difficult to accustom myself to than Agra's multi-jointed gate. Her granite-clad feet pounded into the earth with, enor with enormous shuddering crashes that could be heard even from our rarefied station. I stayed in the city centre, the plateau top Agra's. Stru structure had been covered with a thick layer of fertile mud and planted with grasses and flowers though you could see the iron underneath where a bush had been dug up a few birds even perched in the trees and sang bright melodies before launching themselves at some invisible unheard signal all at once into the sky they wheeled and glittered against the blue and as i watched them i was almost able to believe i was in a real metropolis and not several hundred feet in the air atop a migrating city with an engine for a heart this is a great route i don't think i've done this one before My master and I took a turn about the top deck as we passed within sight of Allahabad on our right hand side. Through the trees we could just see the gleam of the railway line which appeared to end rather abruptly. A photographer had set up a booth on the lawn and was doing a brisk trade taking ferrotypes of families posing in front of the magnificent monument. His hands were stained with chemicals with dark burns visible against his brown skin. He was ex experienced at his trade. He glanced over at me appraisingly. Photograph, he asked in passable French, 10 pounds. I have a feeling it might get sold. Shook my head, having no desire to be exposed or developed. It struck me with, as rather gauche. And from my master's almost imperceptible glance of approval, I knew he agreed. Uh, the whole thing about us traveling around the world is not really a secret, but at the same time, Fog doesn't love it when we, uh, when we, uh, Promote it when we uh, make a big spectacle of ourselves. I was taking a small digestive walk after a substantial breakfast when I saw a young lady in a bright pink sari and yellow lensed goggles pitch herself over the outer railings. I leapt across the deck and immediately entangled myself in some coils of rope which toppled me into the railings in a slightly less heroic fashion. I peered over the edge, bracing myself, but the woman waved up at me cheerily, suspended from the railing by a length of thick hemp rope, rope knotted about her waist. I waved back. Though my fixed expression could hardly have been described as nonchalant even by the kindest critic. The woman sought me out at luncheon, by which time I was much recovered, and she introduced herself as Daya. Mademoiselle Daya, I bowed, a pleasure to make your acquaintance. She laughed in surprise. Your manners are very fancy. I invited her to sit with me, as was only polite, but she shook her head. I don't eat up here, she pronounced derisively before glancing at me with bright mischief. We are a city of many levels. The real Agra is below decks. I'll take you tomorrow if you want to do more than sightseeing. She swept away into the crowd, leaving me to contemplate her challenge over my meal. Yeah, it's draining, isn't it? That's why I was trying to tend to you, my friend. Of course, I went below decks. I am a man who cannot resist a challenge. Daya told me of some of the history and layout as we descended a series of stairs of increasing rit ricketiness. I followed until we reached a stop. My guide raised her hand. The sound of the engines was vibrating up through the floor. The walls here were highly polished, inlaid with jasper and sharp calligraphy. Then she opened a pair of carved doors, saying with grave ceremony, Welcome to the lower city. I blinked my eyes against the light, and as they adjusted, I saw where we were. We had come to a township built within the echoing bowels of the city. Complete with... I don't know why I'm yawning so much. Oh my gosh. Complete with shops and residences, and even people playing games on the street, though these children tossed adjustable spanners and brass rings. A muezzin called the faithful to prayer. Beside it was a granite-faced Shiva temple and a small but attended Buddhist shrine. Daya was clearly a well-known figure and introduced me to her fellow lower city folk with great pride. Almost everyone wore tall belts and yellow-lensed goggles. So, what do you think of my home, Frenchman? It's fantastic, a hidden world. I'm basically choosing on a whim. I'm not thinking about it. I'm just picking one. It's fun. Uh, I would not have dreamed such a place existed beneath the parks of the upper deck. The truth is, I think, that all cities have a below decks, my friend. Argus is just more obvious or less, depending. All too soon I heard the sound of the bells, which signalled our stop. The room around me exploded into controlled chaos. Brass goggled men and women operated, pulled enormous levers, threw open iron grates, and shouted instructions at each other in a storm of languages. The city lurched to a halt. 
Great heart stilled, we had arrived at our, ca- our destination, the British city of Calcutta. Can you tell it has been a long week? <laughs> I apologize about my yawning. We're here. Right, we can sell the saffron crocus for four and a half grand. Oh my god. Tot of rum, leather gloves. I don't know if we're going to go here, but if it's valuable, grab it. Traveling cloak, gentleman will take the gentleman traveler. Uh, self vodka and get the traveling. Oh, still not big enough, is it? Hang on a second, hang on a second. Let's do this. There we go. There we go. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> right. Let's go. We are going to Singapore. Chittagong. Departs tomorrow. Singapore departs tomorrow. We can't speed that up. Okay, we're gonna sleep then. That's fine. Uh, no, not the uh, not the suitcase. Uh, there's no hotel. Okay, let's explore then. Calcutta was an industrial city which had built its wealth on opium, textiles, and indigo. But that was not to say it was uncultured. The chai shops which I passed by were all thronged with affluent babus and behenjis discussing poetry and literature and the sticky subject of Indian independence. It seemed a natural outcome of events, and I said as much to be loudly shouted down by several pro-British voices, who in turn were shouted down by those fervently in favour of self-rule. It was certainly a thorny issue, and I wondered if we would be able to avoid all consequences of it. Do you think there will be trouble soon? I asked. Several voices agreed, but then several disagreed. It seemed there was no clear answer to be had here either. Only time would tell. I returned quickly to Monsieur Fogg. Sleep for the night. I forwarded my master every service because that will get his health back up. There we go. Right. We're going to go. We're going to Singapore. I can go all the way to Hong Kong. Wow. Arrives next Wednesday. That's interesting. So that arrives today. Singapore arrives Friday. Wow. It's a long journey, but I think it's probably worth doing. I don't think we've been to Singapore in this game. Gosh. Kind of exciting taking a different route today. The SS Thunder of the Apcar shipping line had 10 years previously set the record for the fastest journey between Singapore and Hong Kong, and her captain promised us a journey of five days rather than the usual figure of six. Right, we're going to tend to fog, because it makes things go faster too. You're almost entertaining, Passport 2. Jitagong? We're not getting off. There were few passengers on the ship and that handful were nervy Indian labourers bound for Malaya or Singapore. The ship was crewed by Laskars, a mix of Indian Singaporeans, Singaporeans, Chinese and Malay who all spoke an entirely incomprehensible sailor's dialect which I found utterly fascinating. I'm trying to be positive. I endeavoured to pick up as many words of the odd patois as I could on our voyage. Early on the first day, we stopped at the port of Chittagong to take on more passengers. Then the captain blew the whistle loud and long. Full speed, he declared. You'll see. Oh my gosh. I keep attending to fog because I think these journeys are going to be quite tough on him and I don't really want to drop below 75. We dined at the captain's table. He made us toast and then asked Monsieur Fogg outright whether he was an opium trader and I his factotum. I looked at my master who merely said he was not. Captain Ong Ford and commanded our glasses filled once more. It is a profitable business, he advised. A man can make his fortune in opium if, and he addressed the last to my master, he is not squeamish. Morals and all squeamishness? My master is hardly squeamish, I interjected with a glance towards Mr. Fogg. He is a gentleman. And has no need of putting his hand to trade. I fear the captain would be offended, but instead he merely shrugged. If your master has never known need, then his honour is untested. Monsieur Fogg gave me a quelling look before turning to the captain. Your business is your own, Captain Ong, as long as you conduct me to Hong Kong in ten days as agreed. The captain raised a glass. Fear me not, Mr. Fogg. I have anxious customers awaiting my cargo after all. <laughs> is this thunder? Right. Credence, my dear madame, tell me of Paris Passepartout. Singapore? It has a bad reputation. It's great now, by the way. Can I go to... Oh, Port Moresby. Seems impossible. Does the Seine ever flood? Maybe? The river floods every year where I come from. What about Brisbane? That's very far. Colombo? Colombo has a very advanced tram system. Can I go to, Can I go to Brisbane? 
yeah, she doesn't have any, <laughs> any information for me. I didn't recognize any of those other names, so I was like, I don't know where to ask. I work thinking of croissant. Not just any croissant, my friend, but the croissant made on the corner of the street where I grew up delicately crisp on the outside, yielding within. I could smell, almost feel the texture of the pastry on my tongue. I was so lost in contemplation that I very nearly, was very nearly late to attend my master's shave. Zut alors. This game is hilarious to me. It's very strenuous. Yes, I know. I know. Monsieur Falk, I know. Let's give you a little attention. We can converse on this part of the route if we take it. The last cars who made up the crew seemed to find me an object of great curiosity. I found them curious in return. My attempts to learn a few words of their cobbled together tongue were met with howls of good natured laughter. A young Malay shyly asked me what Paris was like. It is beautiful. I said cautiously, the Seine glitters like a snake, the theatres spill light and colour into the streets, the cafes are full of men and women debating and drinking endless cups of coffee, there are beautiful women and beggars all on the same street. I think what the problem is, my friends, is that I'm not getting a lot of oxygen because of not being able to breathe through my nose, so I'm, I'm yawning also as a way of getting oxygen in, so I do apologise. She looked at me curiously, I took a deep breath, dissatisfied with my answer. Never mind my thoughts, perhaps you'll see it one, my, yourself one day. She nodded, accepting my answer. I doubted she would ever sit foot in the city of my birth. Thunder! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Today we stopped at Singapore on the southernmost tip of the Malay Peninsula. I don't think we should get ashore. It says we're going ashore, though, because I didn't pick Hong Kong. We thank the cup. Captain has been disembarked. He nodded, but he was helping to see the back of us. Okay, so let's see what our options are then. There might be another option instead of going all the way around to Hong Kong. I sell anything? Probably don't need the cold climate stuff. Have I got cold climate stuff? Yeah. Let's get a hot hat. If we could get to Manila, would be good, somehow. Singapore was a British colonial port, peopled largely by Chinese, Malays and Indians, and fueled by rubber exports and opium wealth, pouring into the new banks. I walked along the harbour front, inspired brightly, brightly painted airships and well-rigged boats heading for distant ports. I inquired about vessels headed for... We could go to Brisbane or Manila. Let's ask about Manila. She goes to Manila. Uh, Manila, are you a Spaniard? I am French, monsieur. He shrugged. I heard there's cholera in Manila. If you're not a Spaniard and have no business there, maybe you should avoid it. Then again, you rich people do whatever you want. Thank you for the warning. Uh, okay. So we could go to the Philippines. And then we've already got connections from the Philippines, actually. So if we go to Manila, we could... We've got so much money. Let's go sooner. Yeah. More money to go tomorrow. Okay. 10 a.m. tomorrow. I keep hitting the luggage when I don't mean to. Let's, uh, let's sleep. Uh, yeah, let's attend to Monsieur Fogg. There we go, 96 is pretty good. Let's leave. Hopefully we don't get ma <laughs> malaria, uh, cholera. To a passage on a little steam yacht with a cargo hold full of Chinese silk parasols, which the captain assured me would fetch an exorbitant price in Manila. Are the ladies there so shy of the sun? These pretty money makers are only passing through Manila. Captain Amparo, a dark eyed Filipina of middle years, was unable to keep the glee from her voice. I will sell them to a trader for shipment to Acapulco, where the Mexican ladies will pay all of their pin money for a month for just one gaudy parasol. Will you keep one for yourself? Me? What else use would I have such a frippery? I regarded her sensible attire and short hair. I admire your practicality. She laughed companionably. That is a skill I have always possessed. I slept well that night above aboard the steam yacht, secure in the knowledge it was being steered by the captain's steady hands. Nice. Right, so Manila to can we go Yokohama? Can we go Honolulu? Where we go... San Francisco? We already know about that one. Can we go... Salt Lake City? 
All right. We know a little bit more information about getting across America then. Day 26, we're doing very well. In my opinion. <laughs> we had some ill winds in the morning. I dropped my lip balm somewhere. <clears throat> we had some ill winds in the morning, but Captain Amparo kept the crew calm and focused, shouting orders at them in a language I did not know, Tagalog perhaps, as it was widely spoken in the Philippines. We were merely bobbed about a little. Until the weather settled, but the worst injury was some seawater clogging my shoes. We will not be delayed, Captain Amparo assured me, perhaps mistaking the cause of my obvious melancholy. My master will be pleased, I said, though I could not help cast another mournful look at my ruined shoes. The captain caught the attention of my gaze and looked confounded. My god, you are an utter dandy. Do you really care so much for appearances? A gentleman is always presentable. I do not care for fashion for fashion's sake. Manila! Captain Amparo had taken to regarding me as though I were the oddest creature to ever take passage aboard her vessel, and she still looked thunderstruck when we reached our destination. Good luck in Manila, she said, shaking my hand. They will hardly know what to make of you. I've already got geometry. Alright, let's explore. I want to see what other options we've got. Ooh, so we can actually go. Oh, I got excited for a second there. I was like, where is it going? going that way so we can go up to Hong Kong I think I honestly want to take this big big see if we can afford it this big trip from Honolulu all the way to San Francisco see we've got so much money city had suffered the depredations of a major typhoon and the efforts of rebuilding had been stalled by an outbreak of the dreaded cholera morbus. Images of San Roque or San Roque, I'm not sure, a saint invoked against pestilence decorated almost every building and vehicle but to little effect. Infected establishments were burned daily by the sanitary board with our hotel. One of the casualties, we relocated near to the Pasig River, a charming locale thronged with Filipino women in Maria Clara gowns and men wearing the stylish Spanish camisa de chino. Concerned with the possibility of infection, I ensured that Monsieur Fogg drank only boiled water, as recommended by Jon Snow's article in the Medical Times and Gazette, going to the lengths of preventing him from eating any uncooked foods for fear of contam contamination. From my window, I could see carts piled high with the dead being taken to the mountain to be burned rather than interred in a churchyard, which put me in a morbid frame of mind. It does not do well to dwell on such matters, however, so I attempted to put the considerations behind me, but the city smells of disease and I will be glad to leave. Wow. <laughs> I kind of want to do this. Like, I've never done this before. Ah, uh, I keep doing that, guys. I keep doing it. Okay. Uh, we still haven't slept, I guess. I thought we had. Night fell, uh, spent a few hours walking around, found a charming Japanese mademoiselle who had lost a purse, which I helped to find, and who then, in between outbursts of great political passion, let it slip that some buyers will pay well for evening jackets from Vladivostok. I'm sure we are unlikely to head that way. I can't understand travel, and yet, look where I am. Right, so do we want to go all the way? I kind of want to go all the way. Let's go to Honolulu on the airship. Ooh, it's going to take a real, a real hit to us. We're going to have to keep attending to him, I think. <clears throat> we boarded the Reina Cristina, a Spanish Torres Quevedo type airship. It's gondola shaped to resemble one of the infamous Spanish galleons of previous centuries. And has richly outfitted with Philippine hardwood furniture, Fijian silk curtains and lacquered ornamental automata imported from China. My cabin resembled a fashionable salon more than an airship berth. Ooh. Hovercraft. We're not going to Yokohama though, we're going all the way to Hawaii. That would send us backwards, I don't know why that would be helpful. 
Our journey to Honolulu would take four days. The airship would refuel and go on, go on without us. From there, we had other plans. I need to look after Monsieur Fogg. It's going to take a big hit. You're most diverting, my good man. The crew, a Filipino crew, spoke a mix of Tagalog and Spanish, all mixed up with Lascar sailors' cant, which utterly fascinated me. Though I did not have the skill to understand it, don't bother trying to learn it. You need a sailor's heart to do so. Do you know it? I asked slyly. I'm a captain of the ship you're travelling upon, he replied. You should hope I have a sailor's heart. I think you do. I couldn't help giving him a smile, which he returned rather rakishly. Truly, I meet the most remarkable people as captain of an airship. Yeah, it's taking a real hit on... Uh, we have to make sure we look after him tonight, too. I'm worried. Because it said it could be up to 40 points. Portrait of King Amadeo I hung in one of the relatively unused cor corridors of the gondola which I was exploring in hope of finding a secret or two, and indeed I stumbled across a small room set with crucifix and an altar. Clearly someone aboard was, literally, a closet Christian. Over dinner, the captain told me about Honolulu, where we would stop on the morrow. If I believed his telling, it was a giddy paradise that could barely be real. That night, I remembered to adjust the pocket watch as we crossed the international date line and gained ourselves a day. Oh, nice! We arrived into Honolulu Bay in good time, and the crew landed us, then deflated the envelope to refill it. I watched them work. The efficiency was most gratifying. Men and women swarmed over the balloon as it fell on, on itself, jumping clear at the last moment, swinging away on guy ropes that themselves were falling slack. Then we finally discharged from our duty as passengers and the airship lifted away into the sky. A gun! I've got a lot of half-owned... Oh, I've got one complete set. Okay. I don't know if we need a gun. Uh, I mean, we might go to Panama City. I can always take the flower. It was though Honolulu lived in one indrawn breath. A wheeling swathe of sky, white laced waves and pristine sand bounded by black volcanic bluffs. The town was entirely hidden behind groves of coconut and eucalyptus. We rested in a comfortable palm topped hut. There we go, that gave him loads. By the shoreline, breathing the sea air and trying to shake the weariness of the road. Now he says it's in roaring health, that's great. So we want to go to San Francisco. Parts tomorrow. This one, it arrives Monday. This one. It's not even available. We have to go all the way to Panama. It arrives Sunday. I think I'm gonna go... This arrives Monday! But this seems so much further. I think I'd rather go across the States. Tomorrow at 5, that's why. Okay. I don't think I've gone across the States in a while. We've got lots of time and Quite a bit of money, so. Funds go up by earning running errands. Okay, San Francisco. Let's go. A banana boat? Uh, yeah, we're only going to lose 16 because of the Gentleman Traveller set. We boarded a steam barge from Honolulu to San Francisco. The sweat of ripe, scent of ripe bananas pervaded every plank of decking and bulkhead. A sweet, and deliciously rotting odour, which I rather became accustomed to on the voyage, much to the detriment of my keen sense of smell. It's making the news. Ah, I huffed, attempting to convince my mouth that I ate fried kippers and potatoes at breakfast. Oh, I want potatoes. Everything smells of bananas! Monsieur Fogg replied he could not smell a thing, which I took to be his queerly English sense of humour at work. But if bananas were to be the worst of my troubles aboard this boat, aboard this boat, that would be no bad thing. <laughs> Bubble Valley is dapper. I woke in the middle of the night convinced that someone was in the cabin with me. I stayed very still and listened. There was a long, wave-lapped silence until I heard a dragging shuffle. I opened my eyes and looked up. 
my heart beating impossibly loud in my chest. In the darkness, I saw the sheen of a pair of eyes gazing vacantly into the distance. Monsieur Fogg, I cried, and my midnight visitor blinked and straightened and looked about my cabin in genteel surprise. What? He said calmly. What am I doing in your cabin, Passepartout? You would know better than I, monsieur. It seems I've been sleepwalking. I've not done so since I was a child. I let him take... Oh, would you like to stay for a while? I asked him. I am awake after all. I would like that, thank you. Oh, boy. Monsieur Fogg. Let's see if we can go onwards from, uh... Burlington. Burlington to... Washington? Uh, do we not get ask about Burlington? To should we go to New Orleans? New Orleans to Miami. All right. Do, do, do. Well, that's Canada. That's not helpful. <laughs> yeah, it's not ideal. We should have asked about Atlanta. I never remember exactly where Atlanta sits. Captain Kalani was a heavily pregnant Hawaiian woman who found Monsieur Fogg's English accent a source of great mirth. Say something else, she demanded over breakfast. Please, Monsieur Fogg. I let her amuse herself at my master's expense, or he won't like that, and looked on as she took him through an entire phrase book of small talk as she consumed a heaping plateful of raw fish and pineapple with horrible relish. He gave me a beseeching look once or twice, but I merely smiled back at him and returned the perfect valet. So yes, he, he's not happy with me, but that's okay. We'll get it back. Look after him. It's fine. The fourth day aboard our barge passed quietly. Captain Kalani moved slowly around deck, her profile jaw-droppingly large. Will you give up captaincy once you are a mother? She smiled. For a few months, I suppose I will, but I'll feel ill if I don't sport put to sea within the year. Oh, the blush in her cheeks belies her excitement. It's a marvellous thing. That's lovely. San Francisco so yeah we could go all the way to Burlington it arrives on Friday it's not bad it looks like it's a train let's go we can just go okay great <clears throat> choo choo we were lucky to arrive in San Francisco just in time to catch a journey along the as yet unfinished transcontinental express which would take us as far as Burlington in five days with only a handful of stops along the way Right, how do we get from Burlington to Atlanta? Monsieur Durand. Burlington? Atlanta? Do you need to who my father is? Apologies. Oh, don't worry, you will. Lovely. Uh, Cheyenne? Monsieur, really. But the only market in Cheyenne has gone bankrupt, okay? Uh, Dallas, Omaha. None of those things help me. Albuquerque? That's completely the wrong way. I don't know why I even asked. Silly. Silly me. Albuquerque's west. The first day aboard was enjoyable enough. American trains could clearly not compete with the European counterparts, but it was amusing to see them try. The posters proclaimed Pullman's Palace sleeping cars, and while not palatial, in the slightest, they were at least serviceable. I attended to Monsieur Fogg. So we sipped cool beer as we rattled through a long stretch of desert in the shadow of tall mountains. I attended to Monsieur Fogg and his delicate stomach, which was not entirely better today. Yeah, yeah, cool. Gonna go to Salt Lake. Choo choo! Uh, Burlington. Washington. Atlanta. <laughs> I wasn't gonna read any of that out, it didn't seem that important. Our fellow passengers were a curious mix of gold and silver prospectors, homesteaders, farmers from all corners of the world, Mormons, missionaries, soldiers, and stiff-necked gentry of various sorts. I gave a young black woman with a deep red bonnet and an infectious laugh a nod of greeting. Her name was Diana. I'm meeting my husband in Cheyenne, she told me. He did construction work in New York, but New York isn't safe anymore. We have enough money to move now. How long have you been apart? Oh, 10 years, she said breezily. I've been working in rich white ladies' houses in San Francisco. He's been constructing buildings in New York. We've only just scraped up enough money to live together. Oh, 
I told her some tales of my adventures which seemed to amuse her greatly as the afternoon wore into evening and we passed by Ogden close to Salt Lake City. We watched as passengers disembarked, glimpsing fertile fields and well-tended ranches out the windows of the train. I don't think it's wise to get off right now, so... Oh, this guy's rude. You have to visit New Orleans if you like jazz. Can I get to Miami? I don't know who your father is. He's one of the richest men in America. Good for him! Alright, well, don't tell me anything. I don't know why I'm still asking him questions. <sighs> Where's Cheyenne? I need to stop asking him. He's not going to help me in any way. Oh, it's right here. Cholera is spreading from Manila aboard airships. Ooh, uh-oh. Today a fellow with a painfully trimmed moustache and impeccable suit approached me outside the lavatory. I nodded at him companionably, and his thin, thin lips parted in a contained grin. I am Felix Grunge. Granger or Grosier? He said, you are a puzzle. I was flattered. Monsieur Moi. Humble passepartout. I am no more a puzzle than the sun's rise in the east. Truly, I am the simplest of men. Oh no, do tell me how you came to be on the transcontinental. Thereby hangs a tale I could tell, good sir. It seemed a probing question, which made me immediately suspicious of his motives. I made some non-committal answer, but he pressed me further. Finally, I excused myself with some fabricated errand. What a strange, ill-mannered fellow. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous about that one. We'll leave it. Stop, we stopped at Cheyenne, Wyoming for a few hours in the evening. The trim moustached fellow disembarked to talk with a six foot tall woman who wore the largest, the latest, largest, I'm misreading everything, the latest slim trained skirts and a pistol tucked into her waistband. We watched another wise at lunch and I asked one of the women homesteaders who informed me that she was Esther Hobart Morris, a justice of the peace and indeed the first one in America. She sniffed. Honestly, some woman, what's wrong with being a wife and a mother, I asked you. The trim moustached fellow boarded the train again before the last whistle blew his face drawn and anxious we were held up by outlaws they dragged tree trunks over the line and forced the train to a halt before boarding brandishing pistols and sabres they went carriage to carriage demanding valuables I looked at my master who had a certain clint in his eye and I did not doubt he wished a peaceful and quick conclusion. The name is Jesse James. <laughs> now give me everything you've got. The saber lifted to my throat. I handed over my wallet. What else could I do? At least I did not keep all our money in the same purse. Yeah, we've just lost several. Yeah. Buy yourself new shoes with that. He said as he proceeded to steal my shoes. What about you? I dreaded what Monsieur Fogg's response would be. I would trouble you to lower your sword. I listened fearful. You'd trouble me, would you? Somehow I doubt you would... He stiffened a little, his eyes narrowed. I could see he was about to do something terribly rash. I watched carefully. He was standing stiff as a post, the sword point directly on his Adam's apple. He boxed for, for my country, he declared. I, I don't know what to do. I could take no more of this. He is my gentleman. I carry his positions for him. Um, I hit him. Oh, I don't, I don't know what I should do. I suggested we discuss the matter like gentlemen. I don't think that's going to go down well. I don't know what to do here. He began to laugh, but not for long. Just at that moment, a group of soldiers headed by the trim moustache fellow stormed aboard our carriage, pistols drawn. Jesse James lifted his sword and lifted it, held up his hands. You will not take us hostage, I asked him, regretting my words. I've been caught before. I've gotten free before. They cuffed him. Then the steam chain engine restarted. I got some money back. Okay. They were much worse for wear, though our valuables were impounded as evidence. We did not have time to wait for the case to come to trial, but the officer's office compensated us a little to the tune of over a thousand pounds. I still have loads of money, like I've gone through way more of this journey with way less. A kind fellow passenger gave me a spare pair of shoes, and a few hours later we reached Burlington. We disembarked. Our funds have gone down substantially, yet yeah, not badly enough for me to worry, so that's fine. Okay, I'm going to explore because I'm sure there's another way to get out of Burlington. Situated on the west bank of the Mississippi River, and had grown to prominence along with the steamboats that paddled up and down the stretch of the river. The construction of the Burlington Railway Road had caused a temporary influx of Chinese and Irish labourers into the town, where many of them drank and generally had a good time. Let's not be racist. Good times were a scarce commodity in Burlington, or so it seemed to me. 
The town distinguishes itself in my memory as the place where I managed to burn one of his shirts. He was not terribly understanding. I pro apologize most profusely, and he he preferred proper action to tedious apologies. I do not like it. Oh boy. <clears throat> we'll stay overnight. I'm going to see you tomorrow if there's another route out of here. It's been a while talking to the hotelier. Learning that New Orleans could be reached by Houston by hired carriage, but it was tiring, I think, too. Okay. Oh, see that? That's going backwards, though. I think we have to go to New Orleans, though. We've got stuff that's valuable for New Orleans, so we might as well go. It says bearable. So, we'll find out on the trip. We could go east instead of west. We boarded the Dark Queen, a twin-decked six-boiler sternwheeler bound for New Orleans. Uh, the Mississippi was famed for the luxury of her steamboats, but also for their unfortunate tendency towards catastrophic boiler explosions. I felt lucky and quite certain that nothing ill would befall us on our journey to Crescent City. We are certainly due a good turn, were we not? Greetings, Captain. Pass by to you slimy dog. New Orleans. Told you to visit New Orleans if you like jazz. They've got Crescent City. I have no idea why. Can we get to Havana? <laughs> oh, but the fare is well beyond most travelers. Well, we're not most travelers. We've got plenty of money. Then can we go to Port-au-Prince? Or Port-au-Prince? Here's the scuttlebutt. Some buyers will pay well for evening jackets from Port-au-Prince. Do you play the trombone? No. That's a shame. I'm looking for someone to join my band. Havana to Nassau? Oh, Atlanta. Okay. Uh, Panama? Okay. We've got some routes there. So we can go east, which is great. Go down to Havana. That would be really good. Let's go to Cuba. The common rooms and lounges of the Dark Queen were full of gamblers enticing passengers into games of dice or cards. The river ports have been passing more and more regulation, and the cheats and crooks had all fled to the unregulated waters of the Mississippi. The fool and his money are soon parted, so the saying went, I had a little pity to waste on fools. Though Monsieur Fogg clearly found the entire operation distasteful. Captain Latour was clearly quite cosy with the gamblers and had something of their attitude himself. I'll wager I can get us to New Orleans in three days rather than four. Who'll take the wager? Would be a risky prospect. Uh, but I stayed silent. A fellow with a magnificent red beard and sharply pointed lapel staked 100 pounds against the captain. Watch and learn, my friends. You'll see a record made today. Probably would have made some money there, but I'm just being careful. Captain Latour ordered the calliope to pay the calliope <laughs> someone's gonna laugh at me on this one uh i would say calliope at first glance but i don't know to play a tune as he mustered the crew and gave them the order to push the engines to their maximum limit the sho coal shovelers scowled at the extra work but the captain ignored them magnanimously the dark queen's crew seemed competent enough but as the boilers whistled and screamed the ship began to make ominous keening noises I observed the preparations with a somewhat jaundiced eye. Keep shoveling, he shouted, tapping dials and muttering orders. He squeezed more oil into the crank. We'll be in New Orleans by sundown, which is when something began to make a screaming noise. I turned about, looking astern, seeing smoke was shooting from a crack in the metal, and then it was too late. The rear boiler exploded. The entire ship began to shudder and convulse as the sailors screamed and wept and burned. It was hell in the literal rather than metaphysical sense and I was in it. We did not reach New Orleans that day and I wondered if we ever would. <gasps> I never had this go so wrong before. None of the sailors died yesterday, though some no doubt wished they had. A much chastened Captain Latour moored the ship and organised boats to take them to doctors ashore. We went unharmed, but there is no musical laughter on the Queen's deck. And I don't think there will be any for a long time. Oh, that's so sad. We probably lost today, but it's fine. Wow. Ugh. This has become an extremely interesting run. The Dark Queen continued her journey down the Mississippi, though at a crawling pace. Captain Latour 
ordered only two of the five remaining boilers fired and had to offer double pay to the stokers to induce them. What a waste this is. Captain the talk took a gamble this time he lost, that is all. You were a gambling man, I said, thinking of the screams of the sailors. I realised as much the very first day you took me into your service. What is the difference? There is none, he said calmly. I merely have a better calculation of the odds. We docked at New Orleans when the sun was low in the sky, glinting over the brackish water of the river and bathing the French and Spanish colonial villas of the city in soft yellow light. Captain came to see us off. I think this wager has taught me caution. Be aware of New Orleans. She's a city a man can abandon himself in. Ah! Oh, I think I have something I can sell here. Yeah. The evening jacket. I mean, these are valuable. Where we're going? I mean, if we go to, we, yeah, if we end up that way. Uh, can we just plan? I want to go to Havana. Leaves tomorrow at nine. So let's, uh, let's sleep. We could explore. See where, oh, I mean, we can't sleep anyway. Could go to Atlanta and go across the States instead. Because if we're going down here, oops, sorry. If we're going down here. See, we want to go back over here, you see? So it'd be smarter if we went up the country. Departs in two days. See, that's not good enough. That's too... Can we don't make it go faster? Yeah. Spend our money. Let's go. Tomorrow at 12. All right, let's sleep. Let's go to New York. <coughs> I met death in a smoke-wreathed red-lit bar, red lit bar in New Orleans as the jazz band struck up another tune. He offered to buy me a bourbon. Holy mother of heaven, I blasphemed succinctly. He pulled off his mask to re reveal handsome cafe au lait features and dark green eyes that extended a skeletal hand to me. A fine costume. Merci, mon cher. I am death in our neighborhood Mardi Gras and I'm practicing my role. He took my proffered hand and brought the back of it to his lips for a gallant kiss. He flicked me a rather unmistakable look under his dark lashes. I returned his look and let my fingers slip slowly through his. You must call me Octave, mon cher. I am passepartout, an appellation as well as a burden, that I would choose another for you, a special name for you and me tonight, Laurent, for you look a bit like a Laurent, Laurent and Octave. I agreed with a slow smile. They sounded an intriguing pair. Ooh, pass back to. Bien sûr. Octave told me he was a free person of colour now. I was aghast to realise he'd been a slave before the Civil War and indeed still worked as a servant for the very same family. How can you do it? Are you not vengeful? He sighed heavily. Young Claude is a horror and a let little better, but little Henri is still a sweet child. He carted a hand through his thick black hair. They are my half-siblings through their papa. How could you forgive them? You shared a father and yet they were free and you were slave. Our love is a weakness, I'll grant you that. You sound so surprised, my sweet Lachon. Where do you think we mixed folk spring from? I'll wager three quarters of this bar knows their white relatives downriver, even if their cousins by blood don't acknowledge them. There's a horror I cannot imagine. Then your life has been an easy one, eh? I joined the 1st Louisiana Native Guards Regiment after New Orleans was captured by the Union. I still wake up some mornings, not sure if I'm alive or dead. You are alive. He wiped the anger from his expression with an ease of long practice. You look sad, mon cher. What a fool I am to confess these things to you when I would much rather see you smile. I smiled at him. A smile, he exclaimed. It is a rapturous smile full of secrets I wish to unravel. Shall I tell you one? I would be honoured. I dream every night of Paris. I thought he might comment upon my secret. But he took a moment and then said, I thank you for your truth. I will remember it. Death, it appeared. <gasps> kiss death that appeared was a creature of both delicacy and tact alas the hour had grown late and we had to part octave walked me up river i'm saying octave in the french way by the way it's probably just octave to the border of the garden district where monsieur fogg had taken lodgings among the american parvenu the moon shone down on the mississippi and octave leaned towards me and we kissed on the river bank he tasted of bourbon and dark nights and i will say no more of it here a man even one such as i must have his secrets he will be one of them I think, oh, I've never had this storyline before. I'm so happy. That's lovely. Let's go. 
New York, New York. Okay, I'm just gonna be right back. You won't even notice, okay? You won't notice. You won't notice. Though you may notice something different. Ta da! <laughs> I had to go get something that was delivered from my front door, and also I put lipstick on on the way back. Because I'm a little under the weather, in case you can't tell. And it is affecting my, uh, my, my, my general demeanor. So a little bit of lipstick peps you up, I find. Uh, yeah. It looks, makes me look not quite so pale. Interesting. This plays through seed, in which Passepartout too is convinced he has last found his ideal. Interesting. Anyway, we're, uh, heading out of New Orleans on the Piedmont airline. Was it not, in fact, an airline, the fastest railway in America. What could be better for getting us to the edge of the Atlantic? Despite being half a world away, we still had every chance. All right. Greetings, Monsieur Lagarde. Tickets, please. New York to Washington. Uh, I don't want to go any of these places. Atlanta? I don't, none of this is helpful. Do you play football? Yes. I'm trying to start a league back home. Great. New York. Winnipeg? Why would I want to go to Winnipeg? That's very far. Yeah. Toronto? I doubt it. Uh, Duluth? I'm just picking places because I want to end the conversation. Because none of this helps me. <laughs> I want to go to New York and from New York uh, directly across the Atlantic, preferably. Not any of these places over here. But yeah. Do, do. One of the things that arrived was this tiny, tiny little camera for my son. It's so tiny, look. And so he can take pictures on our trip. It's so cute. I have to, like, charge it, so I'll just plug it into my computer. So. Uh, we had set ourselves, <coughs> settled ourselves in a carriage with one other occupant, an extremely large man who introduced himself as Charlie Sullivan, a lad from Birmingham who had grown a... Oh, that's terrible. Most impressively sculpted, thank you. Just especially around the neck and upper arms. His moustaches were nonetheless imperfect. I'm assuming they mean beefy, not fat. Uh, nothing wrong with being fat. Uh, I just think there's some fat phobia that I've noticed in this game, so I'm going to try and avoid having any of that sort of opinion come from my characters here. I asked him uh, where he was going. He replied, New York. I was boxing. I'm going home. I could see he was most likely an excellent boxer, assuming he knew how to operate those colossal arms of his. However, Monsieur Fogg's interest had been increasingly sharply, increasing sharply throughout the conversation. You are trained, he demanded keenly, or self-taught. I've got a manager, he tells me what to hit. I want to hear all about it. I sat back and enjoyed the conversation. The details of boxing are more intricate than one might expect. And hearing the business of cut and thrust delivered in Sullivan's so very English tones was quite informative. Little did I know how the details I heard would come of use to me. What? Oh, they were Pinkertons. That does make sense. Wee Washington. Monsieur Sullivan will, I think, go very far indeed. Monsieur Fogg opined as I bought, brought him kippers from the dining car. He seemed to have the physique, I suggested. Not just the physique. Physique is not the secret. His description of the transferal of weight from foot to foot was very well understood indeed. So you are a boxer, monsieur. I went to school, yes. You mean you boxed as a child? The suggestion he had ever been a child, I quickly saw well beyond the pale. You should fight him, I, he said. I almost choked. He looked at me with surprise. Is something the matter? Forgive me, it sounded as though you said I should fight Monsieur Sullivan. I can teach you to box. <laughs> Perhaps you should fight him yourself. I think no, Passepartout, it is a young man's game. I would very much like to live to be an old man, I replied testily. He considered an inside. If you are unwilling, we should not do it. Certainly you would most likely be brained. It would be a pity. I quietly pressed my lucky stars. There's no way I'm getting into a fight here. Come early evening, we appeared into Washington. I arrived into Washington with several passengers unloaded along with trunks and baggage. I peered through the window in time to see an airship rising into the sky and heading east. I pointed it out to Monsieur Fogg. A connection across the ocean by airship, I declared it may well very fast. Oh, okay, we're leaving the train in Washington. Oops. Okay, hotel, and then we're going to go to the market in the morning. People were somewhat wearing Monsieur Fogg as we roamed the streets of Washington. Several buildings had not yet been rebuilt since the burning of the city by English forces in 1812. I could understand it, remembering the terrible feeling of being under attack for my own time during and during the siege of Paris. Still, 
Everyone was cold. Not everyone was cold. A few people were out to make a quick buck. <laughs> As seems typical for the treatment of tourists well, worldwide. Do you want the full tour, gentlemen? Asked Hank Henberry, a man with smooth dark skin and a fine leather jacket. Uh, as though we were cowboys on his main street at the strike of high noon. We're looking to leave as fast as possible. Leave? Where to now? You haven't seen what this place has to offer. Thank you, we are not interested. Tell me now, what's your poison? Transportation. We need the fastest way to London. Left the gas on, did you? The fastest way I know is the airship from New York, but there's also the route via Ponta Delgada. Is that airship fast? How the hell would I know? Are we wasting your time? You fellas are no hope. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to be given tourist shit. Right, so we can go, apparently, via Ponta Delgada, which I think is... Yeah, there. But I, I should we should have stuck with New York, because that's where I wanted to go. So... <laughs> Oh, we didn't go to the market! Ah! Okay. I want to go to the market. Thank you. I want to sell this. And this. <coughs> Atlantic timetable. Okay, the loot. Via Iceland. Interesting. We're nearly home. Plan. Can we not just go through here? Arrives next Monday. We're very early. It's great. Let's just go to New York. Uh, three days. Nope. Sooner, please. Tomorrow. Pay all our money. See, we've got so much freaking money. Uh, yep. Let's sleep. Going tomorrow. <coughs> Excuse me. Yep. We don't want to dilly dally. We just want to go. A bearable option. Good. We're back on the Piedmont airline, which we never should have got off, I'm afraid. We never should have got off. We just had a little day in, in Washington. Which is, you know, a nice enough city. One of my good friends is there right now. The journey was brief. The Atlantic flashed in the sunshine, beckoning us onwards. We were so close to home. Yes, we are. Four thousand dollars. Tomorrow. We're gonna get back. We're gonna get back. We've nearly done it. It's always very exciting when you finish the run. Seize the thief's hand. Oh, I was trying to pickpocket me. You tangled with the wrong Frenchman, I exclaimed in triumph. The little thief looked up at me with thick lashed eyes. I realised blatantly the thief was a young girl, barely ten. Still, I held on. Are you done, little vampire? She's biting me. For now, what's it to you? I should report to you. Oh, please, sir, don't. I'm a Frenchman at heart. I released her. She had my money still in her fist. I look, I'm just going to dob her in. What's the matter with you? Escaped from the circus. I have been robbed. Don't worry, sir. You'll find those clothes are worth something. I want to see his commanding officer. How I ended up spending the night in jail. <laughs> oh, well. Sorry, I went through that quite quickly. It was, uh, I probably should have let you guys read that. Uh, let's pay nine pounds to get more space in our luggage. Here we are. We left New York aboard the Henrietta. Henrietta. An old Confederate airship converted to a transatlantic mail carrier. We would reach London in three days, barring any unexpected delay. Adventure Fog expected back shortly. Speedy, speedy! The ocean tore along beneath us. I enjoyed talking to no one. There was nothing I needed to know. No one to charm, flatter, or beguile into giving us aid. There was only the wind and the tide. Pass pas tu, my master demanded, make us go faster, if you would. I could just ignore his advice. What was the use? We were home and dry already. 
I'm sorry. Our relationship will deteriorate, but there's really no point. Because we're basically there. And it's not like it's day 76. We're safely within our 80 day window. I could not wait to stride into the reform club and claim our prize. I spent the remaining time watching every possible danger. One eye on the crew, one other on the ship, ready to react to the slightest trouble, but nothing broke the peacefulness of our day. Here we are. We're tethered at the airship dock in Hyde Park and felt for the very t first time in 52 days the feel of English soil under our shoes. At long last, we have returned to London. Plenty of time to win the wager. Here we go. I did it less than 60 days, less than 70 days, I'll show you. Oh, <laughs> here's my, my uh, banking invoice. Oh, it doesn't work anyway. Okay. That's, uh, don't worry about that then. Uh, I, re I got achievements for returning it quickly. I seized my master by the collar and threw him into one of the steam carriages idling on the banks of the Serpentine in Hyde Park. There is no need for such unseemly haste, pass by two. But I was a man possessed. The carriage barely shuttled to a steam hissing stop before I dragged my master from his seat and up the steps to the imposing doors of the Reform Club. I released him only when he reached the Grand Great Saloon, where my master's erstwhile friends stood up from their chairs, gaping in an attitude of great shock. Gentlemen, here I am! The room erupted into cheers. Where had the crowd come from? Had they followed us inside from the street? I had scarcely noted them. I realised as though a spell had suddenly broken that my master had won his wager. £20,000. With the 4000 we began with and our remaining funds, it was a profit of over 19000 hardly a meagre sum. My heart began to beat again and I saw for the first time the crowds who had forced their way into the club to witness the momentous occasion. Occasion. A journalist in a dark blue bonnet caught my eye and you must be the loyal valet passepartout. Ah, madame, you have a sharp eye for indeed I am. I bowed with a flourish. All of London has been feverishly following Phileas's fogs. Progress in the papers. She swept her gaze over me and scribbled furiously in her notebook. Your master will be tomorrow's headline or I'll eat my hat. It is a fine hat. She laughed, then I will be glad not to have it. I have to eat it. I pushed my way through to Monsieur Fogg, who had nearly been swallowed by congratulatory crowds. You have won the bet, Monsieur, I told him. As though saying it aloud once more would make it more real and then repeated again for good measure. He pressed my hand warmly and did not remark even once upon the impropriety of my gesture. Indeed, though his cool gaze did not so much as waver or soften, I believe he welcomed the chance to shake my hand. Any gentleman would be fortunate to call you his valet, and you have been a worthy companion to me besides, Monsieur Fogg said, and I knew that from him there could be no higher praise. Monsieur Fogg! Monsieur Fogg! <laughs> Mr. Fogg! Mr. Fogg! The blue monitor journalist cried, interrupting our conversation. What next for the great adventure of Phileas Fogg and his loyal valet Passepartout? My master looked at me. Why, I replied. To the moon, of course! I looked around at the faces of the assembled crowd and quirked an eyebrow. Anyone care to make a wager? Monsieur Fogg refrained from rolling his eyes. I believe that tonight I will have supper and go to bed. Come on, Passepartout, it grows late. Yes, Monsieur Fogg. Despite the sheer size of the world, exploding Mississippi paddle steamer and American train robbers. So yeah, we only visited 18 cities, but I wanted to do it fast. But I hope this maybe encourages some of you to pick up this game. It is really fun, really unique. No journey is the same. Really fun. Well worth a play. And as I said, quite an old game, so. I, I like all of the stats that it gives you at the end, too. But yes, that's it. And we can start again if we wish to. But yeah, that's, that's it for my playthrough of 80 Days. I hope you've enjoyed these two videos. And I'll be back soon with uh, some more interesting games that I think you should be trying out. Alright, I'll see you later. Bye. Bye.